Um, so a, a branch campus of, of Wright State University. Um, I have asked him to talk a little bit about his background, so I'm not going to give a full bio. I'll let him do that himself and, and kind of talk about how he has uh, progressed through his education and, and has come to be now at Wright State. And then he's going to talk a little bit about a project. Um, we have funded a small grant for Stephen through Ohio Sea Grant. That's how I've kind of come to know him. Um, but he's going to talk a little bit about how that project led into um, what he's discussing today. So I'll turn it over to Stephen yeah, now. Yeah, right. So we'll start with the full bio. All right. So the very first day. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm. I, exactly. <laughs> On that day. I have absolutely no doubt that my, uh, my beginnings are you know, identical to many of the students, many of you guys in this room, um, you know, just a, a kid that spent way too much time outside playing with stuff and, you know, poking things with stick. That's fine. Uh, and so that sort of, you know, leads to, uh, um, you know, early seeds of wanting to study the environment, wanting to sort of know something. You know, you're young, you don't really understand exactly what it is that you want to know, but you know that there's something that's sort of like driving you forward. Uh, and so you end up in, uh, you know, an undergraduate institution, it may be Ohio State, it may be, you know, a small liberal arts school. Um, I attended Ohio Northern University, it's a small liberal arts school, uh, where I did a bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science. And, you know, you major in a program like biology or, uh, or environmental science, and, uh, and you continue on from there. Um, I finished up my uh, undergraduate degrees. Um, kind of bounced around a little bit. I worked for uh, Fish and Wildlife as a, as a ranger. I actually lived in the Okie Finoki Swamp uh, for a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of fun uh, trivia. I was there when the ivory bill uh, oh. was back, right? So I was one of the people. This is, this is my job. Very prestigious. I was given a canoe and like a water filter and like a sack of food and told to just go see if it's there. <laughs> you can go. Just, just go. There's some radios and some batteries, right? So if you need anything, we'll come. We have helicopters. And uh, that was a great experience. Those were like a, kind of my first uh, experiences into research. Um, I've traveled around quite a bit. I've done uh, all kinds of things with freshwater marine biology. Lived in Cuba for a while. Uh, did some marine biology work with the University of Havana. Um, and then uh, pursued graduate education back here in the Midwest. Uh, did work with freshwater systems, specifically fish. Uh, I finished up my uh, dissertation work with Ball State University. Uh, and I'm sort of a classically trained ethologist, so I have passions. Uh, you know, if it's an aquatic environment, it's there. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm in. I'm interested. I'm hooked. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, it was actually about, you know, a year, year and a half ago um, where this project has its beginnings. And uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I was collecting some data for a project that was funded by the Sea Grant Small Grants Program. That's how I got to know Chris uh, and Kristen. And uh, it was a project dealing with swimming performance of small bodies, minnows, and darters. Uh, it was a fantastic project. I loved every second of it. We, uh, the people in my, my lab, myself, we were able to uh, build a swimming performance apparatus, basically a treadmill for fish. And we followed these little minnows and darters in there, and we developed these models to try and understand their movement patterns and try and understand where barriers um, may be that you may not be able to see. And what I mean by that is um, you can see a dam, um, but it's possible that there's other flow restrictions out there, things like culverts. You know, the estimates I've seen are on the order of millions of culverts around the U.S. Uh, you know, so just here, um, imagine on a global scale. And so our intent was to study that uh, and try and project where fishes were being cut off and where they weren't and at what times this was happening by looking at maximum swimming performance. Uh, and that project wrapped up successfully. You know, the manuscript, uh, you know, submitted. I'm on the conference circuit. I'm going around talking. Students are talking. There's posters. And everything's well and good. And I'm giving this talk, giving this presentation, and there's a... Uh, there's a, uh, someone from uh, Ohio Department of Agriculture in the audience, and he comes up to me afterwards, and he says, uh, um, gosh, uh, the fish are, are really interesting. I, I like them, but is it possible that the mathematical model that you developed to predict that could be retooled in some way to maybe understand something else? And I said, sure, what do you, what, what do you have in mind? Um, and here we are, sort of a, a year later, and... Uh, totally outside the realm of classic, you know, ichthyology and classic, um, you know, studies of fish behavior and fish distribution. Uh, and now we're talking about, uh, now we're talking about nutrients. We're talking about um, some changes that can potentially occur in uh, watersheds as a result of management recommendations. 
this particular project again, it has its beginnings in an ichthyology project, it has its beginnings in basic fish life history description. And one thing I want to impress upon you know, you young scientists in the room is uh, don't think for a second that your careers and your, your tracks are ever going to be completely and totally linear, right? Have the ability to be flexible. Expect unexpected things. And, and if something comes up and you're interested in it and it relates, um, pursue it. Be passionate about it, um, particularly if it's something that can have an impact. You know, never pigeonhole or put yourself in a, in a simple box. Always be able to be uh, again, be flexible. Be that scientist that can go and, uh, and, and think quickly and uh, develop new ideas. Uh, and with that, I'll you know introduce something that uh, is ancillarily related to fish. Right? We're talking about habitat, but that's uh, that's about the the extent of it. This is uh, a presentation that I'm really excited to kind of roll out. This is the first time that I've given it uh, in public. I've talked with uh, some of the higher ups, um, you know, with DNR and with ODA in the state of Ohio about this particular. Uh, project, and you'll see exactly why. Um, this is the first time it's unveiled, and I think it's very fitting um, that it happens here. I think it's very appropriate. Next week, I'll be talking with a number of community groups in the Grand Lake St. Mary's area. Um, but this particular lake, as you'll come to find out, if you're not already aware, has, uh, has issues. It has uh, a number of issues that are born out of excess nutrient loading, and these issues are incredibly severe and they're raising all sorts of red flags, but they are not entirely dissimilar from what we see around the globe. Our world is facing cultural eutrophication uh, at an increasing rate. We're seeing halves, ontological blooms all over the place. I listened to our RU talks 10 minutes ago and I heard three, four, five, um, and perhaps all of them were ancillary related to this issue of declining water quality as well as all excess nutrients. And so these results, while they're about one system, um, they're applicable and they're extremely applicable to the kinds of things that are going on right now outside the window. Um, but uh, like all projects, this wasn't done in a vacuum. I'm not a one-person uh, show. Uh, so I do want to acknowledge Laura Johnson with uh, National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg. I want to acknowledge Teresa Dirksen, Mercer County Agricultural Solutions. Um, Teresa acts as a liaison between sort of the scientific world and the agricultural world, and it's an unbelievably important uh, position. So I want to say you know, thank you, especially these co-authors. Uh, Terry Mesher, uh, who's with the Ohio Department of Ag, first came to me with this sort of idea, you know, basic question, can you help us with this? Um, and here we are. Uh, and Greg McLynch, <coughs> who is with uh, Wright State University Lake Campus also. Grand Lake St. Mary's, uh, situated right, uh, right here, northwest Ohio. Um, it, uh, it's a system that has a number of different impacts. We always talk about uh, you know, measuring impacts. What's the value of a system? Sometimes systems have pure environmental value. Sometimes they have economic value. What makes a system really unique is it has this really unique combination of social, uh, economic, and environmental um, value. This system is unbelievably important. And one of the, the most striking things about this system is when you live in the area, and it took me about a year to get it, but once I sort of latched onto this, it was very apparent um, what makes the system unique. And it, I've never worked in a system like this that takes on so much cultural identity. Uh, and this is sort of an understudied aspect of what we do as scientists. We're very concerned with numbers, and we sort of have our scientific method, and, and that's exactly appropriate. Um, but sometimes, you get involved with a project and there's more to it than just that. And I'm not saying go out and, and you know, track down the politics or, or get involved in you know, cultural debates or surrounding systems, but I am saying it's helpful to be aware of them. Uh, and Grand Lake has um, this immense tie to this identity, this cultural identity. Unfortunately, the system also carries with it this long history of water quality degradation. Beginning with the construction, right? It's constructed in the mid-1800s as a reservoir for the Miami Erie Canal. It's one of the few places on Earth where the Mississippi Basin is connected to the Great Lakes Basin. That's a weird thing. That's not possible. That's not how watersheds work. But they can work that way if you dig out a gigantic lake <coughs> and put in some canals. So um, with the exception of a couple of wetlands, maybe in Indiana, maybe in Ohio, um, this is one of the few sort of still existing connections. Um, the historical linkages with draining wetlands sort of 
lead into uh, you know a number of other environmental issues, um, ranging from agriculture and residential development, the sort of classic things you see, all the way to the things that we don't see very often in this area of the world with uh, oil drilling. You know, Grand Lake right out there was the site of the world's first offshore oil rig. Like, I mean, it's not that far offshore, but technically it's offshore. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. We're going to find out how shallow this is. But technically, this is this is a thing. So I don't know if that's a, a claim to, to fame or, or what it is, but it's, it's simply sort of it gives you that idea that the identity of this system is unique and the identity of the region is very closely tied to this. Now, all of these different things that have happened in this region really manifest in the present day right now in nutrients uh, and habitat. As I said, northwest Ohio, here are some stats. Um, in terms of watersheds, 250 square kilometers, there's uh, you know five, six, seven, eight different uh, really small first, second order tributaries that drain into it very sort of basic system. Um, one unique aspect of it is the, the system is really a, a southern system in terms of the actual drainage. There's very little on the north shore that's actually part of the watershed. Um, <coughs> as I said, it's constructed um, early, mid-1800s. It's incredibly large, 52 square kilometers. At one time, it's you know, the world's largest man-made lake. So it's got all these really sort of unique tags to it, which contributes that that identity clause that we're talking about. It's incredibly shallow, a meter and a half. Um, and sometimes not even that. Last summer, doing my routine fish collection, uh, nothing in sight. I'm you know, steaming full speed ahead in the pontoon boat in the middle of the lake, and I just stop. Because that's what happens when you hit bottom. <laughs> Sand, by just sort of slow down to a nice, you just get out and push. And that's it, in the middle of the lake. And you've got literally a mile plus around you, and your boat. So it's incredibly shallow. It's very long. It's positioned in an area that is incredibly born of wind structure, and so you've got this really well-mixed polymictic lake, 15 kilometer plus fetch length. And so this is a well-mixed lake. The sediments are constantly suspended. Um, heavily ag area. The declines in water quality have been linked to nutrient-rich runoffs, and these nutrient-rich runoffs are exacerbated by physical characteristics. Okay, so imagine this, if you have, you know, some quantity of nutrients that go into a lake, uh, does it matter if that lake holds five gallons or if it holds 50 million gallons? Of course it does. Uh, does it matter if those nutrients settle at the bottom of the lake and you've got a lake that's 50 feet deep versus a lake that's five feet deep? Of course it matters. The deck is stacked against this system in the sense that the physical characteristics and traits of this particular basin make it... Um, it make it make it unique to say the least, but it, it, it really provides a sort of perfect storm. A perfect storm that in 2008, 2010, uh, a tipping point was established. This was the year or the year period when the EPA was going around the country and they were really focusing on HABs and they were looking at cyanobacteria levels uh, and microcystis levels and they flagged Grand Lake as, as up there, right? If you Google uh, harmful algal blooms and microcystis, if you Google that, um, like one of the first three hits will be uh, a EPA website, and then if you click on that, literally without scrolling at all, there's, there's Grand Lake. So this has become sort of the poster child um, of this uh, this issue that we face around the country, and we face around the uh, we face around the globe. <laughs> she will grow into a field assistant. That's why she's here, so she can learn, and then. <laughs> We have free labor on the boats later. <laughs> My daughter pays me. So, <laughs> as I said, Grand Lake experiences uh, uh, massive external loading from this agricultural watershed. But because it's so shallow, you can't discount the internal loading as well. There's a great study by Jesse Silver in 2013 that quantified this. Uh, and it really does flip-flop. At certain times of the year, the bulk of the nutrient load comes from the external sources. You'd expect that, right? The fields are flushing in. At certain times of the year, the nutrient loads comes from within. It's shallow, it's polymictic, it's coming from that sediment. We have a legacy effect. This watershed is 80 to 90 percent row crop. Um, <coughs> and while that's high, what makes it really interesting is how many of these operations are coupled with not only row crop, but they're coupled with animal operations. On the, the map here, the uh, dots represent some form of animal operation. Now, Animal operations can vary. You can have um, anything from uh, beef cow to, uh, to dairy. You can have 
uh, swine, you can have uh, you know poultry, you can have uh, turkeys, you can have llamas, whatever it is that you have. <coughs> and so it's not enough to just point the dots on a map. Let's standardize this. Uh, and so if we look at this unit, we'll call it a standard animal unit. Basically, if we standardize the animals into one sort of common form, um, we might be able to get some idea of exactly how much animal activity is in the watershed. Um, so we'll use this, this metric called an animal unit. Let's standardize weights relative to a beef cow. Uh, that means one beef cow is equal to one beef cow. It also means that if you have 20 chickens standing on each other's shoulders, um, that's a beef cow, right? So we can standardize things according to weight and get some idea. Anyway, if you do that across the state of Ohio, there's an average of 21 animal units per square kilometer, 21. If you look at Grand Lake St. Mary's, that number climbs to 370 animal units per square kilometer. That's, that's a large discrepancy. And it's one of those discrepancies that um, you can sort of point to and say this is something that has contributed um, to um, some of the nutrient issues that we see today. Uh, one of those nutrient issues, a couple of years ago, the Ohio Phosphorus Task Force released a uh, report. And in that report, you had soil test levels, STP levels for phosphorus, one of the most important limiting nutrients for uh, these algal blooms, in addition to other nutrients. But right, phosphorus is the one that we all sort of look at. That's why we've got a whole literal task force dedicated to it. Uh, when you look at this, Grand Lake shines out like a, like a red sort of beacon. It's got the highest STP levels in the state, or at least among the highest STP levels in the state. When you look at STP levels, soil test levels for uh, crops, right, you're looking at, uh, you know, um, these different levels. If you look for a, a normal soil test, you know, we'll call it an agronomic range, and you look at what something like corn or soybean needs, it's going to be somewhere in like the 50-ish region, plus or minus a couple. Okay, so 50 is where you want to be. Um, the average soil test levels, the average soil STP levels in Grand Lake are well in excess of 100 plus. And so we've got these levels that are sort of certainly far more than can be even used by the actual crop. So we've got an abundance of nutrients in the soil. We've got an abundance of nutrients in the watershed. Um, and so we have, a, we have a storm on our hands that, again, manifests in uh, these sorts of algal blooms. As I said, this all came to a, a sort of head uh, right in the, the 2008, 2010 with uh, reports and all sorts of warnings. And, uh, and immediately remediation efforts started taking place. But the short answer here is that these problems didn't come overnight, and so the solution is not going to come overnight either. But nevertheless, there have been a lot of things that have been thrown out the lake, and these things have all met with varying degrees of success. Everything from uh, multi-million dollar chemical treatments in the form of alum to try and sequester some of that phosphorus and get it to sink to the sediment, at least for some period of time. Um, dredging, just get rid of the sediment that's in the lake. Uh, put in some artificial wetlands. Let's filter some of these tributaries coming into the lake that drain these fields. Let's do aeration. Let's have best management plans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these things have been tossed at this system. And again, I'll emphasize that they've all had varying degrees of success. What we're going to talk today about are some state rules. Some state rules pursuant to a OAC 901. Um, <coughs> when the lake was declared a distressed watershed in 2011, that sort of opened the door for some of these regulations. This particular regulation that we're going to talk about today is a manure spreading ban. There's a couple other things that go along with this particular regulation, but in effect what it did was implement a full code ban on the spreading of manure um, beginning in 2013. And this particular ban focused on an effective date between December 15th and March 1st. What this says is you can't spread uh, manure. Remember how many animal units we have in that system. So there's a lot of animal manure that's classically been sort of worked into the soil. Uh, we're going to talk about ways that's good, and we're going to talk about clearly ways that that can be bad. Um, but effective, December 15th to March 1st, beginning in 2011, phased in very gently, and then with a hard enforcement in 2013, uh, there's absolutely no application uh, allowed. And so the question we have here is, can we look to see whether there's an effect of that? Right? Did that make a difference? Did that make a dent in some of this external loading? Um, and as I said, manure application is an incredibly important resource. It's a recycled form of fertilizer, which automatically makes it uh, go up in our books in terms of importance. It's a recycled product. It's uh, obviously going to increase crop yields. Um, the use of manure as opposed to commercial fertilizer, at least in the Midwest, 
has increased in recent years. We're seeing a decline in commercial fertilizer. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in manure. It provides this really nice synergy between crop and livestock. You've got this sort of feedback. Right, you use some of those crops to feed the livestock. You use the livestock waste to sort of feed some of those crops. It's a, it's a very nice sort of cyclical thing. The problem is what happens if that cycle gets broken and something gets out, something gets loose, um, you know, the fences go down. So <clears throat> in the United States, about 5.9 million, 1.8 million tons of NMP, respectively, are produced in animal-based fertilizers. Uh, by spreading manure, it helps to build nutrients in the soil. It can reduce some soil compaction. And quite frankly, it just eliminates the stockpiling of manure. When you have large stocks of manure, it creates a point source. When you spread it around and you mix it in, you let those crops take it up, it can kind of reduce, um, reduce that. But there's a problem here. What happens if uh, this cycle gets broken? What happens if there's runoff? So let's look at some factors that affect runoff rates uh, in fields, okay? Uh, ground permeability, uh, crop presence, ambient precipitation. Uh, what would be the perfect storm? Well, an impermeable ground, no crop, and the spreading of manure with rain. You know, when are you going to have these four things come together and converge? You're going to have them come together and converge in the winter, especially in Ohio winters, where it can be a blizzard one day and it can be pouring down rain, uh, liquid rain, not the frozen rain. It can be pouring the next day. And so if you spread manure on frozen ground, there's a high potential for runoff. Uh, and that's what we're trying to target here. We're trying to sort of take this period of time and say, okay, this is when we are most at risk to violate all of these things that we know increase runoff rates. And let's just let's just let's just stop. Let's just not even make it this an issue. Let's just uh, put a blanket ban in place. Um, prior studies have shown reductions here, anywhere from five to twenty. These studies are really dated. They're from the 70s, and there's only a couple of them. Um, and so there's really never been a study that focuses like this. These are sort of, you know, a couple of controlled studies. Um, nothing really done on this scale. Um, experimental plots, yes, but nothing done sort of on a watershed scale um, where it's kind of anything can happen. Um, there's a need for these sorts of monitoring effects. These are some images that show you kind of what happens with this. And here's sort of the aftermath. These are Grand Lake uh, watershed. And so that's, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Does sediment and nutrient concentration and load uh, co-vary with the timing and implementation of this manure ban? In effect, does this manure ban do anything? Um, let's look at a site with long-term monitoring data, uh, and let's ask the question. Let's look at this. Um, let's ask the question, has there been a change in total suspended solids? Has there been a change in nitrate? Has there been a change in Keldol? Has there been a change in particulate phosphorus? Has there been a change in uh, soluble phosphorus uh, over the sort of past decade, starting with um, you know, the earliest chunk of our data set all the way up to uh, present day? This particular study is going to use a lot of uh, acronyms and sort of abbreviations. Most of these are very apparent. I'll be reiterating them, but if you see them up there on the screen, um, you know, here's the kind of key. Um, one of the ones I want to point out, when I say flow, I'm usually going to use the word Q, or use the acronym Q, that's sort of our abbreviation for discharge. Uh, when we talk about seasonality, keep in mind, um, when we talk about seasons, nutrient application rates are going to vary by season. So that's something you should account for when you're looking. If you know some prior information, you should incorporate that prior information into your approach. Uh, and so we know that, uh, you know, very broadly, um, application rates will vary. So we broke this into a sort of winter and a summer. Winter is defined. December to April, summer's May to November. Um, <clears throat> we're testing the efficacy of this manure ban. Um, the data on this particular site that we're going to be using is a tributary within Grand Lake Watershed. Uh, this tributary began its monitoring life in 2008, uh, and it continues to present day. So when we say pre-manure ban, it's really 2008 to 2011. Remember, 2011 is when the manure ban, it gets sort of phased in. And then 2013 is when the hard enforcement starts. Um, the cliff notes, um, just to sort of stem the question, uh, it doesn't matter which way you analyze it. If you start in 2011 or start in 2013, you get the same sort of pattern. Um, so for our pre-manure band date, we're going to call this 2008 to 2011. Our post-manure band date, 
we'll call it 2011 to 2016. Again, we're assessing the changes in nutrient concentration and loading over time. Now, there's a problem that anybody that's ever looked at nutrient data in streams understands and runs into. Um, there's a lot of problems. But one of the biggest problems with nutrient data in streams is when there's changes in flow, there's changes with the nutrient, but it's not linear. In fact, it's decidedly anti-linear. It's non-linear. Uh, and you have to account for that. And classically, the approach has been to either get a long enough time series that you sort of smooth out the bumps in the road by having just simply tons of data. But if you don't have tons of data, like we don't here, right, we're only going from 2008 to 2016. Uh, how do you deal with that? Um, classically, there's been some other approaches involving natural log transform, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, when you look at that, you still have very odd relationships. Uh, in addition, nutrient data can't be negative. Okay, you can't have negative nitrate values in your stream. Um, also, most nutrient data in general tends to cluster closer to zero than it does to uh, infinity. And essentially what all this means is from a statistical standpoint, nutrient data is challenging. From a statistical standpoint, if you try and fit a normal curve to this, um, you will fail because your values are going to be right skewed. You've also got nonlinear relations with flow. Uh, so how do you deal with this? You have to sort of start to chip away at this. Again, there's some approaches um, where you just get a lot of data and just sort of throw it all in there, and that's that's okay. That'll that'll let trends kind of emerge. Um, but if you've got a data set like this, what do you do? Um, we implemented a, a general linear model fit with a gamma distribution. What this gamma distribution is able to do is it's able to account for the fact that it's impossible to have these sort of non-zero um, these negative values, and it also accounts for the fact that you're going to have that sort of skewed uh, nature. So this was kind of this was the model that. Uh, that I, uh, I worked to, uh, to sort of develop and implement with the swimming performance uh, where this whole talk started. And this was a model that somebody looked at and said, that sounds a lot like water quality. Data. I wonder if we can throw some stuff out. It's not fish. Uh, it's not as much fun, but we'll go with it. This gamma distribution worked, and we're going to visualize and break down flow by percentiles um, for management interns. We're going to be looking at some long-term monitoring data. This stuff is coming uh, out of the Heidelberg Lab, the National Center for Water Quality Research. Uh, it's absolutely an amazing facility, um, one of the best uh, in the world, I would uh, say. That could be uh, absolutely verified. It's, it's incredible. They've got water quality stations uh, around Ohio. I think they even have a couple that sneak up into Michigan. Uh, but these water sampling stations are all paired with USGS staging stations, so you've got flow. They all have auto samplers that are flow dependent, which means they can take uh, one water sample a day if it's sort of just a normal flow or if you get a lot of really sort of uh, mercurial flows that sort of go up and down quickly, you can take up to three samples a day. You can store them, you can preserve them, and then you can bring them back to the lab. Uh, you can use colorimetry for total phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, and TKN, uh, ion chromatography for nitrate, and then uh, just basic filter, just filter some, uh, uh, some, some water through a um, you know, through a pre-weighed filter and then we'll weigh it again after and you've got your gravimetric method for total suspended. So that's kind of a breakdown of the methods um, of where this data comes from. Um, here's a, a hydrograph. Uh, every one of these dots is a month. Um, just look at the big picture. It's not really important to fixate on any one area. But um, one thing you're going to notice with this hydrograph is that we've got some variance <coughs> flow between these different uh, points. The pre-regulation period that we have data for had uh, comparatively lower flow than some of the post-regulation period. Uh, again, we said we had to account for this, okay? So if you've got a difference in flow, you better be prepared to sort of uh, work with that. And so again, um, what we use with our GLM model is we use the interaction terms to sort of hold flow constant uh, and then um, look for the effectiveness in this band by season, look for the effectiveness in this band um, overall. And uh, again, when we go to visualize it, we can actually break it down into categories. And we'll see what we do here in a second. This graphic, right, they always tell you when you make a PowerPoint slide, don't do this. It's a violation. Um, the top left, Q, that's just another way to visualize flow. Again, these are mean values. You're going to see a lot of these, um, a lot of these, of these, uh, these plots. These plots are 95% confidence intervals, and then that point in the middle is just your mean point. 
So it gives you an idea of variability, uh, and these interval plots also give you an idea of what that mean is. Um, what you'll notice with flow, again, is emphasizing what I said based on this graphic, is you've got lower flows here in the pre-data, higher flows in the post. So you would expect there to be a relationship there. Uh, so let's account for that. When we look at some of the general trends, remember, these are just annual trends. These are not corrected for flow. We're going to do that in a second. But if you're just going to look at descriptive statistics off the cuff, what would you find? Um, well, you find this sort of stair-step approach, which is actually pretty encouraging. You find that these nutrients are going down, despite the fact that flow is going up. Now, there's no statistical rigor behind that. That's just our eyeballs working, but we'll put the stats to it in a second. But the first pass at the data, right, you always want to do a first pass where you sort of look at some of these general descriptors. When you do that, like, there's something here. So when I did this and plotted this, um, I sort of nodded and made another cup of coffee and sort of strapped in because I knew this would be kind of a fun thing to focus. It's no fun when, when you really um, are hoping and sort of rooting for uh, positive effect and positive change uh, and you don't find it. But this is, this is not that story. This is a good story. This is a success story. Let's look at uh, how good. Those are concentrations you're loading. These are concentrations. Now, let me uh, throw something else out there. Our concentrations, when we took those data, we took just normal concentrations, just like you guys would out of your seal auto analyzer, um, you know, over across the way there. Um, but what we were able to do, and this is a technique that uh, Heidelberg does uh, quite often. It's, uh, it's uh, popping up more and more in the literature. It's a very nice technique. We used what's called a flow-weighted mean concentration. What we did was we took our uh, nutrient concentration data and we standardized them by day, by flow. Um, and essentially what that does is it allows you to sort of look at each day overall. And when you do that, the concentration data, and these are all milligrams per liter is what you're going to see. I'm not going to write milligrams per liter 50,000 times. It's all milligrams per liter. Um, what this allows you to do is directly convert back to discharge. It allows you to directly convert it back to loading. Uh, and so if you are looking at these graphics, you're looking at these figures, and you're like, okay, how does that concentration uh, translate over to loading? Well, just simply take the amount of water you have, there's your concentration. So the two variables are, are, are almost interchangeable. And that's the sort of beauty of the flow weighted mean concentration. Again, it's getting used more and more. Uh, but by doing that, it allows you to sort of visualize concentration. And while you're doing that, that's the exact same thing as loading. Because concentration is one thing, but the loading aspect, I'm glad you brought this up, the loading aspect is what's really important. Because you can have the most concentrated sample in the world, like, oh my gosh, the highest nutrient level ever. But if there's only a gallon of it going into Lake Erie, you're going to be okay. However, if you have something that's a quarter of that, but there's, you know, the volume of Lake Michigan coming in, We've got more problems than just the nutrients at that point, but you get the idea. <laughs> you get the idea. So, again, let me violate the golden rule of presentations. We're not going to dwell on this, but this is just to sort of demonstrate that we did, in fact, do the model. There it is. Um, but uh, for you students in the room, I did want to put this up there uh, and sort of emphasize these sort of model building uh, techniques. One of the things we can do right here is with this interaction term, remember we said we'd hold flow constant and then look for the efficacy of that time date, the pre versus post, asking whether or not there's an effect. So that's kind of what that looks like. We're going to look at seasonality, winter versus summer. We'll look at pre versus post. Uh, and now what we're going to do, because at least my mind doesn't operate in terms of tables like this. My mind operates with, with uh, colorful pictures, <laughs> sort of like moving parts. That's sort of my, uh, uh, the way I work. Uh, and I imagine many other people are visual learners as well. And so rather than stare at this table and sort of ooh and ah over estimates of standard errors and t-values and t-values, et cetera, et cetera, let's just look at the chart. Uh, and this is what we see. Let me show you how to read one of these. This is about as simple as it can get because this data is complicated. But I promise once we get our heads around this visualization, it's, uh, it's going to be pretty powerful to see. What you see <coughs> down here on the very bottom of this first plot the Q, 025, Q2550, Q5075, et cetera, those are flow percentiles. And so 90 to 100 percentile are like 100-year floods or gully washers. These are the ones that are really putting a lot of water into a system. Zero would be like a dry stream bed or like a trickle, okay? 50th percentile would be somewhere in the middle. You know what I mean? So you can just take these and sort of visualize all of the different flows in your mind 
And if you're curious what all of the possible flows are, just look at a plot like this, because I did. And then I just looked at all of these things, and I just put them in order, right? The lowest one at the top and the highest one at the bottom, and then just started cutting them off, okay? So 0 to 25% of the data rests right here, 25 to 50 right here. And you just develop this approach. Basically, it's quartiles, pretty standard stuff. Just break the flow into quartiles. Uh, I snuck one extra thing into the last quartile because the 90 to 100th percentile is really important to look at because, again, as I said, these are the really nasty flows. And when it comes to nutrient loading, it comes to problems. It doesn't matter if it's Grand Lake or if it's Lake Erie. It's some of these high flows that really pack a punch, and they give us a lot of our volume. So if we look at this, we also know that because we're dealing with agricultural runoff, there's a seasonality component. So let's break this down uh, between summer and winter. Remember, the ban is effective during the winter. Let's look at the pre-post as well, because that's why we're here. Pre is before manure ban, post is, uh, well, it's post manure ban. Um, these are those interval plots. Remember, we have our mean value, and then we have our 95% confidence interval. Um, and what you're going to see is this really nice trend emerging. doesn't matter, uh, at least in terms of nitrate, our NO3 values, what flow category you're looking at. Um, the season, our pre-post, there's that discrepancy. And that discrepancy grows as we increase in flow category. And this is exactly what you would expect, first of all, with nutrient data. You would expect it to go up with flow, okay? So gravity works, uh, things are good. You would also expect, um, you would also expect some of these patterns involving uh, summer uh, and winter to emerge, especially differences between some of these different flow categories. Um, but what becomes really interesting is when we look at this pre-post and we see these two trend lines sort of bifurcate and go away from each other. This is telling us that there's something going on. And the thing that changed is what we're testing. This is the manure band. So did the manure band have an impact on nitrate? Absolutely. If we look at those means, and we're just looking at the means. Let's just sort of ignore the, uh, the margin of error for a second. Let's just look at the means. Um, and let's just sort of look at a blanket change percent. When you look in the winter, you see negative reductions. And this is pre-post. Uh, negative reductions when there's low flow. Negative reductions when there's high flow. Negative reductions at medium flows. You see reductions in this nutrient post band. Uh, during the summer, the story is a little bit different. Um, you actually do still see uh, quite a few negative reductions um, at the sort of medium and high flows. At the lower flows, there's actually an increase, but if you look at what that means practically, uh, you're going from like uh, 0.66 milligrams per liter to one milligram per liter. So this is a, a fine case uh, between sort of statistical difference and practical difference. Um, it'd be worth sort of noting. Those differences sort of crescendo up when you get into the upper echelon. Let's look at 90 to 100 percentile. You're going from like 25 milligrams per liter down to maybe 12 milligrams per liter. So you've got uh, to sort of keep things in perspective when we're looking at these. So again, this is nitrate. Um, we switch gears and we look at the total suspended solids. You don't see a whole lot, uh, a lot of these tiles at low flow, these, uh, these run fairly clean. Uh, when you get at high flows, nothing runs clean. And so you see that. And again, you see the discrepancy between the pre-post. You really see it during the winter. Uh, again, if a graphic like this um, isn't as appealing as a table, we can look at just the raw percentages. During the winter months, pre versus post, we can see up to 60% you know, reduction in some of these flow categories. Right? We're still seeing a consistent reduction. During the summer, the results are a little bit different. We'll talk about why that might be uh, a little bit later in the, uh, in the presentation. We look at particulate phosphorus. Um, let me throw a disclaimer out here. Particulate phosphorus was um, calculated by taking a measurement for total phosphorus, a measurement for dissolved phosphorus, and then just subtracting them. So it's sort of an indirect way of getting at particulate phosphorus. But essentially, this is the phosphorus that's bound to a particulate. This is the stuff that's bound to dirt uh, in this region. And we know that there's something going on here because of our soil levels that we talked about in the Grand Lake watershed. Uh, again, we can see uh, a reduction. We can see the pre-post values. We can see those constantly going down. That's what you're looking for, that sort of slope down into the right. And we're seeing it in the summer. We're seeing it in the winter. We're seeing it. Uh, during these different flow categories. Most importantly, we're seeing it at these high flow categories. Uh, to the tune of, you know, the 
between 15, 40, 60 percent. Again, it's important to keep in mind the actual uh, metric or difference, uh, but I promise that these sort of medium and high flows, it's, it's quite practically relevant. It's quite significant. And this one's a little bit stranger. If you're looking at this graph, you're like, I don't see any pattern. Um, it's, dissolved phosphorus is, uh, is one of the stranger things that came out of this analysis. Um, and dissolved phosphorus was something that when we controlled for flow, there was not an overall effect. Now, when we break it down by seasonality, you start to see something emerged. Uh, you can see it a little bit with your eye. You can see it a little bit with the table. However, when you look at these margin of error bars, and that's the great thing about uh, you know, using a statistical test, um, because our eyes can sometimes trick us, and that's sometimes what happens here. Even though you start to see you know, maybe something there, maybe there's something there, uh, you know, maybe it goes up there in a weird way, um, this one's kind of, it's very mercurial. It goes, it goes up and down quite a bit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why that might be later on in the talk, but um, there was not a clear-cut uh, difference here statistically. But um, when you look at the sort of seasonality, it does look like there's something happening in terms of some things going down. Again, statistically, it didn't pop out, and so um, you sort of have to look at it. But if there wasn't anything going on, you wouldn't see the sort of, directionality that most of these are pointing to. So this is just a case that we need to monitor more. We always say that in ecology, but we need to monitor more. We need more data. <laughs> um, TKN, remember what uh, TKN is, by the way. This is sort of getting at our ammonia. TKN is just a combination of ammonia and organic nitrogen. It's a little bit different than total nitrogen. Uh, total nitrogen obviously couples nitrate, nitrite, uh, ammonia, and then the organic as well. So when we look at this, um, we see some good news again we see this sort of decreasing trend no matter where we're at. Um, to the tune of between 15 and 70% reductions at these different flow categories. Remember, the reason we're breaking it down by flow is because it matters. These nutrients all relate to flow, and they all do it in a very weird way that we wouldn't prefer, but they do. So we'll deal with the sort of nonlinearity of it. Um, reductions in the external loads of TSS, uh, particular phosphorus, nitrate, and TKN were really apparent following demand. Again, as I said, this is a success story. There wasn't a statistical change in uh, dissolved phosphorus, but there's something going on there. Again, that's why I sort of emphasize we need to we need to know more. We need to keep monitoring this sort of anomaly. If you want to call it that? Um, the DRP notes it might be due to the excessively high SPP levels. Again, among the highest in Ohio. Um, what we might have is this sort of legacy effect. Even if you're not applying the manure, clearly there's less stuff going on, but it still might be leaching out. Um, I say legacy in the sense that, you know, if you built up those SDP levels, they might still leach for some time. So it, you can't necessarily throw something out and say it, it was worthless or it wasn't effective. You have to sort of give it time to sort of clear the mechanism. There is something going on with everything else, um, and so it's, it's time to sort of zero in a little bit more in DRP. Um, there was this weird result, though, at low flows. Um, if you look back at, uh, people watching at home just saw the screen flicker a thousand times. So if you look back at some of these low flows, um, there's actually some fairly high levels. As we said, nutrients scale with flow. So this one's sort of bizarre. Um, so what might this be? Uh, in the working group that I was uh, really exploring this, we, we sort of coined this the sunny day effect. Uh, this is something that uh, a couple of other folks are going to look into a little bit more. But essentially what the, the sunny day effect um, might, uh, might look like is imagine a situation where you have fairly low flow and you start to have a sunny day in the middle of winter um, and you start to have a little bit of meltwater. You can potentially have tiles running even though there's no flow, and those tiles are going to be supercharged if they're drawing from the sediments that already exist. So this sort of sunny day effect in the middle of winter uh, is something to look into. Um, again, a couple of people that are starting to sort of turn gears in that direction. But uh, again, more time, continuing monitoring efforts. Interestingly, both seasons were affected. This is good news. Um, even though the ban is during the winter, we saw sort of changes in both seasons. They weren't equally affected, however, and they were affected differently in the directionality. For example, the summer, the largest effects were at high flows. 
Uh, during the winter, the largest effects tended to be at low to medium flows, even though there's still effects at high flows. The largest ones were at low and medium. This might be due to some other management requirements. Um, I get this question a little bit um, in terms of, uh, you know, do people hate this? You know, if somebody was thinking about this in other watersheds, and this met with lots of resistance uh, and things like that. Um, and I will say that, uh, you know, early on in the planning stages, it sounds problematic because you have to find some way to deal with the accumulated manure stock. Uh, and in this particular watershed, one of the ways that that was dealt with was a lot of manure storage bond construction, a lot of agreements with moving manure around to sort of other areas. Um, but uh, anecdotally, in terms of a yield perspective, does this impact my yield? Uh, no, there were no negative yields reported to local soil water conservation offices. And if there was a really nasty effect on yield, if everybody's yield tanked, if you, you know, took your bushel per acre and, and, and halved it, people would have told somebody, they would have said something. Uh, so anecdotally, right, there's no way to get these, uh, these numbers without going out to individuals and sort of getting them, and that's something we were talking about doing. But um, in terms of anecdotal reports, there was nothing, uh, nothing negative. There might be an issue with timing, though, as a result of this ban. As you can imagine, if you can't spread the manure, it doesn't mean the manure is going to stop being produced. The reason there's so much manure there is because of the coupled nature of the, uh, of the row crop and the uh, sort of excess animal units. And so um, we might have this problem where the manure piles up in the winter when you can't spread it, and then as soon as that date hits and the manure ban is up, the regulatory period is up, Right? What is it? Uh, it's like March, uh, March 1st, right? So March 2nd comes around. If there's no snow on the ground, you're out there. Um, and so this is something that has to be dealt with. It's something that has to be, and I don't mean the word dealt in a, in a harsh way. It's something that has to be studied. Let me just back up and say studied. It's something that has to be looked at. Uh, because if that's happening, that could potentially be harmful. Uh, it would be harmful. These results, they provide a, a template for management strategies. Grand Lake, um, it's sort of held up as this uh, example, again, as I said, about uh, uh, harmful algal blooms and excess nutrient loading. Uh, and sometimes it gets, you know, almost sort of smiled at or, or smirked at like, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that's just it's going to be a problem. Um, but this is a good success story. This is good news. Here's an example of um, a policy or a management strategy, and it worked. Um, and so can this be applied to other watersheds? I would say absolutely. If you have a watershed and you have nutrient loading, and that nutrient loading is coming out of, uh, you know, animal lots, uh, yeah, I think that this this could be a potential template, um, and that's one of the reasons I was so excited to kind of bring it, uh, bring it here to uh, to this audience uh, today, because there's a lot of reason to start thinking about nutrients and start thinking about ways uh, to mitigate and start thinking about uh, ways to approach them, you know. None of this stuff, though, would be possible without cooperation. A huge thank you to the, you know, agricultural professionals in, uh, in, in Mercer and Ovid County in this watershed because it, you know, they stepped up and they affected positive change. You know, this, this wouldn't have been possible to have these results without somebody sort of looking at these regulations and following these regulations. Um, one of the last things I want to leave you with is this sort of bird's nest of a of a of a table, and that's the sort of future of this project, and that is we want to kind of look at did we just set ourselves up to have excess application um, as soon as the ban is up? And if you zoom into the dissolved phosphorus, which is kind of what we're most concerned about, if you zoom in with this, and I'm going to sort of pull that plot right out, um, and if you break it down by maybe month, which this is, or if you break it down by uh, growing category, what you're going to find What you're going to find is when you break this down by period and then by flow regime, you're going to find that as soon as you come out of the winter period where the ban is, right, we can see these reductions, the pre-post, we can see a reduction. And then as soon as you come out of the winter ban, the post period, even after you correct for flow, remember that's the problem, child, so we have to sort of correct for flow. So as soon as you come out of that, <clears throat> that period, you can see these applications, um, or you can see these concentrations, rather, uh, go up. <clears throat> this seems to point to something different. This seems to point to um, 
you know, a potential difference in application rates before the ban and after the ban relative to these pre-plant dates. <clears throat> Again, this is all very preliminary. It's all very anecdotal at this point in terms of what happens as soon as March 2nd comes around. Um, but again, this is a work in progress. Nothing said that it had to be set in stone. And so we've got one thing that works. Um, and now if this is an issue in the future, um, approach it like that and, uh, and work with people to um, bring those concentrations down. And so to continue the ban on winter manure application, continue to maintain current nutrient plans, continue to work with farmers, continue to think outside the box, continue to research new and innovative ways. Don't just stick with this, but you know, maybe something with retention ponds. Drainage water recycling is coming online. You'll hear more about that in the, uh, you know, in the next few years. Saturated buffers, bioreactors potentially, blind inlets. These are all ag practices that can help. But it starts with cooperation. It starts with education. It starts with sort of getting the word out there and understanding these problems. It, uh, it starts with these very basic efforts and these very basic conversations you know, with people uh, in this room. Fresh water comprises such a tiny percentage of our global water. It houses well over 100,000 species, 6 plus percent of the described global biodiversity. But on a global scale, uh, our tax are largely imperiled. About 20% of freshwater fish are extinct. Right, the theology is coming out. Um, and so we have this obligation to understand it. Uh, we can't stick in our own lanes. We can't stay in our own boxes. We have an obligation to look at larger pictures um, because if we don't, the consequences in the future can be something that, uh, that we don't want. And so I want to encourage you all, especially the young scientists in the room, to, to think outside your box once in a while, to think outside your lane and sort of bring in some new and innovative solutions. Don't uh, uh, find yourself sort of only in one area. Um, you know, be bold, explore, and uh, try and make a difference. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. reduction has exceeded the phosphorus reduction. Um, and in terms of what, what that's going to do, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. My guess is there's so much extra nitrate that they're not even getting close to that. That yeah, was our initial right. conversation. That was our initial thought. There's a lot. There's a whole bunch. Um, you but You can get that from the data. Yeah, you, right. you have all the data you need. To yeah. Uh, and, I, and I forget exactly what other data that, that Heidelberg uh, collects in terms of chemistry, but one thing that might be interesting, I mean, you know, the information looks pretty darn convincing. Um, but, you know, the other thing that would make it really, like, I think shine would be, is there a conservative tracer? So I'm not sure what, what you would use that might not be affected by egg, but, you know, sodium, for instance. Could you see that sodium does not change? as you might expect. So that way you could definitively show it was actually the, the practice that changed the, those, those chemistries as opposed to yeah, so, something else happening. So Heidelberg does, they collect a swath. And I'd encourage you to, to check out their website. It's got it all listed. It's a swath of data. And there were, <coughs> early on, a number of, of, of ions that we looked at um, that were sort of ancillary in that, in that regard um, that didn't show that impact you know, when you corrected the flows. Right. There was nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, of whether or not that's sort of the, the end all be all, and whether or not like that's the that's the sort of golden ticket, I I don't know. It's um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of data there. Did you blow nine girls for me? Did not. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you know if the nine that you reproduced 
where the band was greater than it was after the band was to kind of increase the amount of red money. So I I wish that number was was tracked. Um, I mean that, that would involve going to every literal individual. And that number is I mean that's that number would be possible with uh, huge numbers of labor work. But what I can say. Um, and, and I did say that there wasn't uh, a sort of negative effect on yield, and I didn't say that out of individual data that I analyzed. I said that based on ancillary information that there were no real negative effects reported to soil mars. So it was sort of anecdotal. So let me talk anecdotally here and just take a broad spectrum swipe at that. Um, I don't think there was less uh, production because animal production in the region didn't go down. So an anecdotally, there weren't less animals. So there, there weren't, uh, there wasn't less manure. We know there's less manure being applied. Um, yeah, does that answer? Yeah. 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 Um, so sort of looking at like the big picture, is um, when you're trying to like reduce runoff and stuff, and like you're saying that the you're like stockpiling just manure is kind of not really a simple way to like go about um, reducing that. So our Uh, no, that's not a focus. So the reduction of, of animal-based ag, I think there were a couple of questions there, so I'll try and address them. So the reduction of animal-based ag, um, animal-based ag is, is important. We need it, right? The, the lots with thousands of chickens, right, those provide uh, food, the, you know, the beef cows, the, you know, the dairy cows, that, that kind of, I mean, these are all the swine. These are all things that, that we depend on. That industry is there. Uh, and so, um, a reduction in that is not, not what we're talking about. Um, to the other question about are we looking into ways to deal with these sort of stockpiles that accumulate, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and one of the great things is I have wonderful partners on this, uh, on this project. Uh, I couldn't have done this without them. Let me throw their information up one more time. But um, this is where that change, the ground level change, is really going to be kind of carried um, by a couple of these a couple of these folks on here, um, and they are developing some unique and innovative ways to deal with some of this excess stock. One of which um, is uh, being looked at specifically by Teresa Durkson is uh, dewatering technology of manure. And so let's take the actual mass of it and let's dial it back. And so if you can dewater that with something like a Fournier press or something like that, that might be a way to sort of deal with it. So there's, there's stuff that's kind of in the works. Um, I wish I could talk more. I think I just spit out all the buzzwords I know about it. But um, <laughs> uh, we have to go and get Teresa in here. Um, but yeah, yeah I mean, again, my, my costs are, are really working on a lot of that ground level tech. And, uh, and that is a huge issue. That, uh, again, that plot we put up at the end, it's, it's something that we generated to look at. It's, it's a bird's nest at this point. We haven't really put a lot of hard stats to it. But visually, with your eyes, you can see that the, app, or the, uh, the concentrations which is a reflection of the application rate, we can see that that goes down post manure ban during the period of the ban. We can also see that as soon as the regulatory period, March 2nd, hits, it goes up. So something, something's happening there, and we need to, uh, we need to dig in and, uh, and look at that. And again, it does nobody any good to sort of uh, point fingers or anything like that. It's, uh, cooperation is what made this work, and that's what will make it continue to uh, continue to work. Um, so good, good question. Thank you. And again, I think we might be about out of time. So thank you guys so much for your attention. I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, if you have other questions, please come see me afterwards. I've got the uh, you know, contact info that uh, something comes to you later. You can uh, reach out that way as well. So thank you. second part of our uh, lecture series this evening, we have our uh, guest lecturer, Yvonne Vadimakor. Um, she is also from Wright State University here in Ohio, but she is actually at the main campus in Dayton, um, and she is a professor there in the bio, is it a biology bio, yeah. department? Um, and then she also, similar to Stephen, has a little intro on how she um, got to where she is now. 
And so I will let her, her do more of the intro from there. So thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about attached algae, and I'm going to do that as sort of incorporated it into the arc of my career and talk a little bit about how to become a scientist and what opportunities to take, et cetera. And then I'm, but in a first with that, it's going, I'm going to talk about what I did. So it's kind of a lot to put in one talk, but I thought it would be fun. So this, as somebody saw, was algae should be eaten and not seen. There's where there was a saying which your generation probably hasn't heard a lot of. Somebody should be even not heard. Um, <laughs> algae are a major part of food webs. And if you see them, there's a problem. But when they are doing their job, they're pretty cryptic. And that's good. And it's unfortunate that right now, with tabs and everything else, algae quite simply have a bad rap. They're really an important part of aquatic food webs. And learning about them and what they do in a healthy aquatic food web is really important. Um, as Kristen said, I'm from Wright State University. I also do research in East Africa. Um, I'm actually in this picture. I'm right there, <laughs> diving. My husband Elliot took this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures of me working. Uh, but we have a website, intolthewrist.org, if you're interested in some of the Africa work. And it's actually one of the main goals of that is to sort of get girls especially, but young people interested in doing science. So my talk is going to have some threads. I don't want to give you a roadmap here. These are just themes that seem to have occurred throughout my career. One of those is obviously algae here, some Plodophora. I want to talk about mentoring and just the mentors that I've had um, and really acknowledge them because early on in career, people who take an interest in what you do are really important. Um, I'm going to say repeatedly, you should look for opportunities rather than obstacles. You can do a lot if you just jump at opportunities. Uh, I also have a theme throughout here, just talking about how scientists learn about how systems work. We have a lot of different things in our toolbox, and different things are different and appropriate at different times of your career and in different contexts. And just sort of being aware of that is really important to a, in a, to a good scientific career. Um, the, the final thing, oh, well, no, not the final but I also want to just talk about transforming curiosity into knowledge for humanity. Um, Darren was doing a lot of, what's, you know, how are you going to pitch your science, et cetera. Most of human sort of increases in prosperity and other things have really come through basic science. Through somebody just being curious about something and discovering something, a lot of times it didn't have an application right away. And yet it turned out to be useful. And you should just always be aware of that, that you don't always have to have something that you can sell and tell immediately some, to somebody, oh, this is really important because of this, this, and this. Sometimes this discovery is both fun and the, the, the fruits of that are not, will not be seen for a while. There's also this really common thread in my life of rocks and fish. You may talk about algae, but there's going to be rocks there. So how do you, what, what is it that, that makes a good scientist or how do you become a good scientist? Being a really weird kid, is a good place to start. <laughs> this is me at eight years old picking up rocks out of a stream in Glacier National Park. I'm still doing that, and I've still got the weird hair. Uh, important mentor mentors are really important, and having just people that encourage you. This is uh, a good friend of mine who, who died a year ago, actually, um, Mike Holmes, who treated me like a grown up, and actually, he was a microbiologist, and when I asked him things, he always told me about science. And he, encouraged me on different things. This is his son, Robin, whose birth I was at, who is now an aquatic ecologist too. Which, so he obviously influenced a couple of us. He loves fishing, and then he obviously got a couple of us to love being around um, aquatic ecosystems too. Um, one of the things Mike did was he gave me my first fish tank. And when I was in, this is my seventh grade science class. <laughs> I turned this into an, a successful NSF grant 30 years later. <laughs> put ecosystem, I now consider myself an ecosystem ecologist, I made ecosystem two words. <laughs> Anyways, it was all about how fish eat plants and all this stuff, but my kid suggested, he'd give me the fish tank, he said, write a report about your fish tank as an ecosystem. I said, what's an ecosystem? <laughs> and he told me what an ecosystem was. But, you know, that was seventh grade. And another strange connection.
connection with Mike was, was my next mentor, who um, I went to a community college. Uh, I was actually the, I was one of 11 kids, the first person to go to college or graduate from college. Um, but I just went to these two community colleges, and my first teacher there, who was actually also a microbiology teacher, had this little card on this. Um, this is my first opportunity story, and I'll try not to take too many of them. <laughs> so this little card on the bulletin board, and it said, internships at NASA Ames. And I took it up to my teacher, and I said, I want to do an internship at NASA Ames. And he immediately checked excellence on all the things. He didn't know me from Adam. It was a big day of class, right? So how could he know I was excellent at anything? And I said, why did you do that? He said, well, it's up to you, you know? You probably are as good as anybody else, so go to an interview and, and um, see what happens. It happened that she'd actually worked with my friend Mike Holmes in, in some place in my interview. I said I knew him, and she got excited by that. Anyways, I didn't realize how unusual this was at the time. This was my first and only female mentor. She was a very early, very successful scientist at NASA, and this is my first story about just Thinking about research ends up having um, value that you don't anticipate at, at first. <coughs> and really, I actually only learned about how much, how about valuable the research I was doing at the time was one week ago when somebody, when I told somebody I worked on this model. I was 19 years old. I was doing the types of things you're probably doing on your research project. I was helping out. Um, but one of the things we were doing was they wanted to find out what the effects of space flight was on bone growth. When astronauts go into space, they basically, they don't have any weight on their bone, they see out all their calcium, they come back to Earth, and they can't walk. Okay, so, so it actually has a pretty profound effect on astronauts. So you could say, well, there's just a few people <laughs> going up into space. This isn't really broadly applicable. But what we were doing was we were figuring out how to get these rats so that they had weight on their front legs and no weight on their back legs. And the reason was you could then compare what the load-bearing bone did on the front leg with the non-load-bearing one. And when I first got there, we were sort of gluing plastic to the rat backs and kind of holding them up and sort of partially suspending them. And then we discovered you could do the same thing by the tail. Okay? This sounds horrible. <laughs> Trust me, it's a lot nicer than putting Reese's monkeys and entire body cast, which is what other researchers were doing. The, and the rats are actually pretty content and happy there. So I was shocked when I went to look up Emily. She, her papers are among the most cited in NASA history. She's in the NASA Hall of Fame. Um, this Heinlein suspension model is considered a classic. And this is what I just learned this week, talking to the geologist, it's like, you worked on that? It's like, well, yeah, I sort of helped invent it. I didn't know it was a classic. I didn't know this was, but it's actually, what it's been useful in is, People who are ill are often in bed for a long period of time. It's directly applicable to anybody who's not using their limbs for whatever reason. By studying these, you know, what I used to humorously call rats in space, we learned a lot about human physiology. Um, so she did many uh, shuttle flights. That was the sh I predated the shuttle. Um, and she, I love this, she's the co-founder of the American Society for Gravitational and Space Biology, which has become astrobiology, which I think astrobiology is kind of cool. They can save life to try to figure out if there's life in other places and stuff. So. Anyways, that was a lot I didn't know about what was my first science job that was completely by accident. When I was in that lab, I worked for a postdoc, and he said, you should go to the University of Montana. Now, I never heard of University of Montana, but my mom had, and she's like, that's a great idea. <laughs> so I go to University of Montana. University of Montana has a biological station. Biological stations make biologists. The experience you're, you're having now of working with scientists, and what I learned was I like playing the boat. <laughs> this was really fun. It was like within a week I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, and just so you know, keep this in mind, most biological stations are sort of taken out of trouble. They're not supported. They're not respected for what they do, which is train new scientists. If you're, if you're experiencing this station and having fun, it's a real gift. And it's really important that these types of stations are available. I did an undergraduate research project on nutrient diffusing <laughs> Pipons, which I just talked to somebody about. There you go. This is my first project. Be careful. I have studied algae for the rest of my life because of that project. So <laughs> you never know. Your first undergraduate project, that's what happens. Um, but I kept having this experience. This is another thing you 
board more experiences, right? Um, now, the types of plots that are used are these, um, <coughs> that are, they're plastic and they're slightly different than the clay pots. I can't, couldn't find it. Had I known, I could have taken pictures of your pots. I could have shown the original ones. Um, the good thing about this was this is a type of experiment that's small scale and practical. It's good for undergraduates. You can ask very specific questions and good, good answers. It's not widely applicable to a lot of different situations, but it's very, very useful. I came to the conclusion they were overrated. I didn't like them, um, but that was good too. I always tell my students, going to college is just as important to figure out what you don't like as it is to figure out what you do like. Both things are valuable. It was the 80s, there was a recession on, it's just the outlook for science was awful. You know, we were worried about nuclear holocaust, it was horrible. Um, but I had, to, I, there was no money, so I had to find a way to fund my education. And I did that, I, I found another little um, thing, which was a little card that said, you want to go and ha go to an internship at Oak Ridge National Lab? I knew about algae, they needed somebody to study the algae. <laughs> That's where I went. So I spent the summer at Oak Ridge National Lab before I even started my master's and got some money to live on. I worked on the National Forest Service, picking up rocks, <laughs> going up and down streams, looking at doing embeddedness surveys. This was actually really fun, really healthy work for the summer. And I went on a Korean fishing boat for three months, which was uh, me and 135 Korean guys. And I basically looked at whether they were adhering to our uh, fisheries limits and whether they were doing what they were following U.S. rules. I was in the Bering Sea. <coughs> Very cool. Learned a lot about fish. Learned a lot about another culture. Having to mask all these different types of weird things. I was just trying to pay for my education, but I ended up with a resume that is actually very attractive to professors and other people who wanted people who just, you know, oh, can you start a boat? <laughs> you know, can you can you do this on your own? Can you work your 10-hour days? Can you go, you know, up in the mountains and come back safely? Those were all actually pretty important. And I didn't think of it that way, but that's how people who looked at my experience thought of it. I went to the University of Notre Dame as a, um, as a technician, and David Lodge kept saying, you should get a PhD, you should get a PhD. It just wasn't in my, this wasn't what I was wanting to do. I, he just kept, it was like a drip, 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 drip. Anyways, eventually the drip worked. I decided to get a PhD with him. I learned another type of really valuable type of experiment, which is whole lake manipulation. So you take, if you really want to understand how an ecosystem works, changing it, and watching how it responds to that change is really, really important. These whole lake experiments, which you were involved in, yes, um, were what classically called the trophic cascade experiments. You can see here that instead of just putting nutrients in clay flower pots, now I was dumping them in the entire lake and seeing what happened. Um, they're very realistic. You can't do a whole lot of them. Some of the things that, you know, like your little clay flower pots give you lots of replication. This doesn't give you, like, that much replication. It's like no replication. You have to, and you have to study for them for several years. Um, the main question was basically at this iteration of the trophic cascades were how do nutrients plus food web manipulations affect lake ecosystem structure? The classic food web really, probably even still, if you see a food web for a lake, you'll see this. You'll see plankton phytoplankton that the plankton eat, that the little fish eat, that then get eaten by big fish. And they were manipulating how many big fish and little fish there were, and they were manipulating how many nutrients they were for, there was for the phytoplankton. Another thing that's important as scientists is to see what's not been done. Like, look for the opportunity. Look for what nobody thought about before. Well, one thing that for some reason nobody really thought about is Real lakes have bottoms. They're not these big blue things that go on forever. They have boundaries. And those boundaries are actually very <coughs> biotically active. Um, so I knew about attached algae. Remember to play flower pots. <laughs> so I got put on looking at the algae on the bottom. And this became very interesting because, of course, we're adding nutrients. You can think of algae as nutrient limited. But these algae are growing on the bottom of the lake. They need light. They're not going to photosynthesize if they don't have life. What does putting nutrients in lakes do? 
What happens to Lake Erie when you put nutrients in it? it turns green. Right? The light goes away. So you could say, well, nutrients are good for algae, but that's only if you're thinking about just phytoplankton. This is me studying attached algae in different it got better than the clay flower pot, so I'm going to go all over the world here pretty soon. Um, so it's good for algae in the water column, but it, I showed that it actually just depressed algae on the bottom of the lake. And you might say, well, that's okay. There's not that much algae on the bottom of the lake. Who cares? Which is pretty much what everybody says. Um, so then the question becomes, well, how much, how important are those algae on the bottom of the lake to the ecosystem? to whole ecosystem production. If you're looking at a food web, there's photosynthesizers at the bottom. You have algae in the water column, and you have algae on the bottom. So I needed to know how much would they really contribute to those different things, or to, to whole e ecosystem production. Again, I like travel. So <laughs> I wrote an NSF uh, postdoctoral grant to go collaborate with somebody in Denmark, because Denmark had lots of small lakes that were full of like Green Lake Saint Mary. <laughs> Basically, they put their agricultural manure on it. Um, and while I was there, I got to go to Greenland. Here I am crossing crossing a very turbid or a very high river in Greenland because we had a sunny day and all the ice melted. The, the lakes that I was snorkeling in and diving in in Greenland were usually half ice covered. <laughs> it was it was kind of cold. Um, here I'm in a, a hut, but. Greenland doesn't have all those nutrients. So now I have the opportunity to look at high nutrient small lakes and very, very low nutrient small lakes. So it's actually pretty hard to find low nutrients. So this is another really important scientific method of just comparing things across large spatial scales. It's a very important scientific tool to help you understand, well, yes, I'm looking at my little thing and I'm com making conclusions about it, but what does it look like at a global scale? And I got to do that by going around the world. I like doing that. Um, I also got to compare scientific cultures, and this is something that I would encourage you if you go on in science to really do. America isn't the only place, and there, and there are lots of places that are probably going to surpass us really soon if we don't keep investing in science. And those other scientific cultures are really interesting, and you'll learn a lot from going and interacting from, with those people. So. What I showed by doing all those comparisons, here I'm going to actually show you some data. This is how much the attached algae on the bottom of the lake contribute to whole lake primary production, so the total photosynthesis of the lake. And in those green lakes that were really shallow and all benthic and very clear, pretty much 100% of the production was benthic. The, the water in the water column was like distilled water. There wasn't any phytoplankton. The Danish lakes that they've been putting uh, manure in um, had no benthic production. They were small, but they basically, the lights were out, there was only phytoplankton. And then those U.S. lakes that I studied that we put nutrients in did a transition between pelagic, to, uh, all benthic production to all pelagic production. So I was able to show that actually whole, attached algae are really important to total whole ecosystem production. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I decided that I was going to aspire not to do this. I was going to submit it to science, right? Because that's like nobody's paying attention to these. This is a good thing to, to submit to science. It got rejected. Oh, well. <coughs> Failure is a good thing to do. And don't look at the obstacles. You know what that got me to do? The rejection. The reason it was rejected is this is only important to small And I thought, that's dumb. may have a small proportion of littoral zones, but they have a huge littoral habitat relative to, say, a pond, right? And so that actually got me thinking, I should study large lakes. The picture here is of Lake Tanganyika, and you don't see any algae. You don't see any attached algae, and you really, and it's pretty darn clear. But all those organisms that you see in this picture eat algae. So these fish, this fish eats algae, this fish eats algae, this fish eats algae, this fish eats algae. All these snails, that's all they eat is algae. Most of the food web eats attached algae. Funny you don't see any attached algae. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually, I'm going to come back to Lake Tanganyika in a minute, but I want to talk just about these large lakes in the, most people call the Great Lakes, but there's great lakes all over the world, but the Laurentian Great Lakes. And this is some work that my student, Leon, 
um, Katona is doing. And this picture, uh, Prior Fasikis took, and he was great. He was diving with us. He's another. He's the partner of another of my PhD student. This is Lake Erie. This is Lake Huron. Is it six meters? They're both six meters. Okay. So that's the same depth in two Great Lakes. Okay. The difference is astounding. Okay. There is actually benthic primary production going down on down here, <coughs> as here. Here I'm using a fluorometer, which some of you guys saw today while we were in the lab. But as you can see, there's probably going to be a higher percentage, even though like here is really shallow and you'd think it would have lots of literal production or maybe a lot of it, there's not a very much light to get to get there. So so light, just as my my story with the other lakes, light is important in the Great Lakes too. But big lakes also have waves. Okay, and this I actually just took this morning because I didn't have a picture of waves in Lake Erie. <laughs> but basically, there's wave action. And Leon did this really creative thing. He, you know, I said, you need to worry about disturbance, the wave disturbance. So he went and he figured out this is uh, the wind pattern for Manila Bay, which we were just visiting yesterday. He didn't get this done yesterday. He got it done a few weeks ago. <laughs> this is, so he took this and he, he figured out, well, what's the average exposure of algae growing at a certain site at a certain depth? Okay. And so he corrected for that in Lake Erie. And what you see when we look at benthic productivity in Lake Erie, again, this is um, Manila Bay, very shallow, you'll see rocks that look like this. And at, at two meters, this is what the rocks look like. So if light's a problem, it sure is showing up because productivity, this is the productivity of the algae, and this is percent surface light. So here's up to the surface, productivity is actually increasing with depth. The reason for that is basically it increases as wave action decreases. So you can just see that this is the exposure index that Leon came up with that I probably can't, I can't tell you about because I didn't do it. <laughs> and this is this is primary production, and you can see that as the um, exposure declines, you get increased primary production. So in Lake Erie, actual wave disturbance is really important, and I would guess that it's important to the point where by the time it's not important, there's no light anyway. <coughs> I mean, we'll see as we do some more research. In Lake Huron, you can correct for exposure, which he did, and then he took the residuals but of exposure. So after he corrected for exposure, then he looked at how much unexplained variation there was in productivity, and you can see that basically now, as you increase light, you're increasing productivity. Okay? And it's because Huron has a much deeper littoral zone. Okay, so it's interesting because I, I said that earlier just about Lake Erie. It seems like it ought to have a liter lot of literal production because it's so shallow, but because it has so, so little light, what happens is, you know, basically the literal zone gets compressed and compressed and compressed, and then on top of that it has all this disturbance, so you actually don't have a lot of literal production to support the food web. So, what we know so far is that basically literal algae are controlled by the amount of light. They need light. Disturbance basically messes them up. So, you know, places like streams, they do pretty well with, with a fair amount of disturbance. I didn't talk about nutrients, but you can definitely make benthic algae grow better if you add nutrients. It just, you have to take that in the context of how much light and, and disturbance there is as well. We know that they have high production in clear lake, whether they're big or small and in, in small lakes that are clear. In small lakes that are clear, they can be essentially a lot of the total production. And here, Leon and I are doing some cores in Lake Huron, so you can see again, it's pretty clear. And again, Kyer took that picture. But the question is, so, so I told you it's an important part of production, but does it matter? We've had those perfect test cases. We've had these aquatic food webs that go phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish, fish, seem to have worked perfectly well for, for a very long time. Does it really matter to anything that, that whether there's benthic algae or not? Are they part of the food web? Um, so I say this is a new technique, stabilized soaps, because at the time I started doing it, it was. It was, again, uh, again one of those opportunities. Just take the opportunity, there's this new thing, I'm going to learn about it. And I'm not sure how many of you know much about stabilized soaps in terms of food webs, but essentially you can 
I can take a sample of your hair and tell you whether you're a vegetarian or not. Um, you can grind up a fish and tell whether it's eating benthic algae or, or uh, phytoplankton. It's a very, very useful natural tracer, and I'm not going to go into it in any greater detail than that. Let's just say that it helps us understand where organisms are getting their food, whether they're eating off the phytoplankton food chain or the benthic food chain or both. Okay. And I worked with Jake van der Zanden, and what we showed was that, yes, you have trophic cascades where these big fish eat the little fish, and that has a very strong effect on the ecosystem. But that big fish is actually getting energy from all these other little things that it'll eat. Fish are opportunistic. You should be opportunistic, too. Look at the opportunity you get. Fish will eat whatever they can get their mouth around, and they don't read books about what the food chain looks like. So fish actually eat a lot of, of um, benthic organisms and benthic algae. And if we look at stable isotopes, this is a comparison of 75 lakes that Jake and I did, where we looked at the percent reliance. We, for each, each fish species, we looked how much do they rely on benthic algae versus pelagic algae, and how does that scale with lake size? So in lake, big lakes, is it all pelagic? Because <coughs> the habitat's pelagic, so maybe that's mostly what they eat. And in fact, that's not the case. As you go to bigger and bigger lakes, you still get a pretty consistent, you know, all fish seem to be about 50% 50% pelagic, you know, if you kind of add all the species together. And that's a little weird. It's like, well, that, that doesn't seem right because big lakes, like, have a big pelagic habitat. Why are so many fish eating literal? So I went to the literature. This is another great way to find data. Right? I just went and I compiled a bunch of literature from the data, data from the literature. It's past my bedtime, guys. <laughs> You're lucky to be getting a talk from me at this point. <laughs> and I looked at where fish live. And I did this very deliberately in the biggest lakes in the world. Okay, So basically, if you're going to find fish that just the only real true pelagic habitat in lakes is in large lakes. And if you're going to find pelagic food chains, they're going to be in the biggest lakes in the world. And I categorized them based on their diets and based on their habitat. Did they live exclusively in the littoral zone and eat in the littoral zone? Did they live in the littoral zone and something else, like littoral and go on to the open water or profundal zone? Were they exclusively profundal or exclusively open water? There were very few fish species that are exclusively open water, i.e. the zooplankton. There are very few fish species that are exclusively profundal. There were quite a lot that are exclusively literal, and a lot that use the literal habitat plus one other thing. In fact, the majority of the fish fall into that. The majority of invertebrates fall into that, too. Okay? It doesn't mean that most fish production comes from the literal zone, because a few small fish can be very productive in the middle of a lake, but the species richness, the, the number of species, is very much tied to the structurally complex littoral zone. And that's why you end up with that signal. We're not looking at numbers of fish. We're looking at numbers of fish species. And most fish species live in the littoral zone and consume littoral um, resources, and by implication, littoral algae are, are, are um, stable isotopes to death time. So in terms of attached algae and aquatic food webs, they're eating many by many fish, especially in the tropics, in both marine <coughs> and freshwater tropical areas, like 50% of the fish species are herbivores. Um, in contrast, in temperate areas, a few are. It's, it's harder in the temperate areas to eat nothing but, but algae. Uh, attached algae is eaten by many bugs and snails, and those things are then eaten by fish. So this is a really important part of the food web. So the next question is, I asked you about this. It's funny that you don't see any algae here. <laughs> there's nothing there. Um, there's actually quite a bit of algae there, and it's very, very productive. It's just a very, very thin biofilm. So I, I just finished a review with Mary Power, who's done a lot of stuff on trophic cascades in, in streams, and we were looking at just this attached algae as the cryptic base of food webs in both lakes and streams, just in freshwaters in general. And this is some of her work um, that I hope some of you have read. They're, they're very classic papers. Um, this is, this, these are compostuma minnows in an Ozark stream, and they basically, she's put out tiles, uh, 
if she excludes the minnows, she gets lots and lots of algae. When she lets them in, there are tons of fish eating the algae, and all the algal production goes into fish production. It's very efficiently converted into fish. Um, we do this in like Tanganyika. We cover the rocks so that fish can't get there. And literally, when we take the, the covers off, so the, the like mesh covers so that the light gets through, to try to measure production, it's almost impossible to get production measurements before the fish come in and eat the algae. The fish just want to eat that algae, and they're very good at it. Um, up here, insects do the same thing. These are this is Cladophora that where um, there were no grazers to eat the Cladophora, and you get these big long strands of Cladophora. Conversely, if chironomid midges have their way, they make they eat the Cladophora, they break it up, and they make it into this little fine net, so that you actually it just they just break it up physically and they eat the epiphytes off of it. So you get actually much lower biomass of Cladophora when you have efficient grazers present, especially like caddisflies and stuff. But the, the chironomids do a lot too. So both insects and fish can basically control attached algae. In Lake Taganika, I've done a lot of work. This is a um, Petrochromus cichlid called Texas Blue. That's not his name. It's the, that's what they call this particular um, species. And this is how they feed. And they very effectively um, basically graze down this algae. So there's lots of nitrogen fixtures and lots of di diatoms here. And they're just keeping the biomass down. This is Lake Tanganyika. It's the second largest lake in the world, um, second deepest. It's second only to Lake Baikal in volume and depth. And um, Mary and I have been studying this stuff. And we, this is just a figure from the paper we just did. And we kind of came up with sort of these three groups of what you see when you have grazer control and then when you don't. Because there are lots of things that can prevent grazer control from happening, including um, flash floods wiping out all the grazers. But if you have really mobile, scraping grazers, you end up with this very thin film of diatom. They can be very productive, but there's not lots of biomass. You can also get. These mo I showed you these pictures of mobile browsers and clippers. They're not, they're not like gouging out the algae. They're just kind of picking at it. But they're keeping really still a very, very low biofilm. When you don't get grazers, you start getting these dense growths of epiphytized chlorophytes, especially Cladophora, Digiaclonium. And you get big masses. And you do get grazers. But they're grazers, tiny grazers that are kind of living on the algae. And they're eating all the epiphytes off. <coughs> But here you kind of have this really low crop to grassland, and here you have this giant forest. So here you have a very strongly inverted biomass pyramid. Here you don't. You have heavy biomass of primary producers, not very efficient uh, transfer up to higher up in the food web. Here you basically have the algae production going directly into fish or invertebrate production. That's a lot to say about the slide. Um, in Lake Tanganyika, we were interested in what's breaking down this grazer control. And we kind of discovered this by accident. We went to a national park that we'd never been to and discovered that we didn't really understand Lake Tanganyika because there were actually many more grazers than we thought. The rocks were much cleaner. We were used to think, seeing things not quite this bad, but almost this bad. This is a pretty, pretty big Cladophora bloom in Lake Tanganyika. This is a crust of algae that's very thick. It's like almost a centimeter thick. I know this sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very, very, very degraded, non-grazer controlled site in Lake Tanganyika. So for one thing, it's a really low nutrient lake, right? But so, so we, what is it that made, that prevented these grazers? It wasn't fishing, actually, I could, but uh, I digress. These fish are keeping the algae down here, and they're not here. Um, Although this doesn't look bad, and you know, Cladophora looks worse here, I think some of the same things apply. So, algebars are the only guild of literal fish that are in decline in Lake Tanganyika. So, Lake Tanganyika has about 300 species of fish. Most of them are endemic. This is amazing radiation. Uh, probably 40% of them are algebars, and that's the only type of fish that's actually declining. And it's happening, you know, I mean, that doesn't look like much of a decline, but it actually is. Those are densities. Um, this is not my data. This is a Japanese study. Our data actually show the exact same thing over the same, you know, 20 years. And, and it's, it's very obvious that this is a real decline. Um, 
I put this to my graduate student, um, Ronaldo Manubi, who's from Tanzania. I should have another. And this is another one about seizing opportunity. I don't, I don't, okay. Ronaldo's a very good Christian woman. She hated this to me when I was telling you this. She, from, uh, she lied to me. I, I, <laughs> I said, I needed somebody who could swim. Because all of my, all of my research is done by scuba diving. This, Ronaldo wanted this job. And the only thing that she couldn't do, that I wanted her to do, was to swim. So she told me she could swim. And she learned how to swim which, at 40 or whatever she was. It's a, to learn to swim and skip dive is pretty amazing. But again, she really wanted it. She figured out a way to get the job. She had, um, she had a six-year-old kid at the time. That didn't stop her. She, while she was my PhD student, she had a baby that weighed a pound and a half. That didn't stop her. She, she finished her PhD in, in five years. Very determined person. Okay, so Ronaldo's work showed first that algal boards do keep um, algal biomass um, low. So she was looking, this is, she did a survey of these different, 12 different sites, and she looked at fish densities, um, which required that she swim. All of this requires that she swim. She did, she did fish, uh, she did snorkel surveys, figured out fish density, and then this is, uh, we have this for chlorophyll as well. I, I prefer organic carbon. So this is the amount of organic carbon on the rocks. And you can see that as fish density goes up, algal carbon goes down. We do have an outlier site that I'm not going to talk about in this. We kind of know why, but we're not going to talk about it here. So basically, the fish do reduce the algal biomass. We have experiments to support that. I talked about those. Um, this is a heavily sedimented site. This is site seven. This is a pisivore. It's not an algivore. Um, Elliot took that picture. We found that sediments negatively affected algal boards. Where there's inorganic sediment, we, we had lower fish density and pretty strongly. Um, Ronaldo looked into some of that that changed their behavior. She did behavioral studies. Um, essentially, the sediments on the attached algae posed a physiological cost to the algal boards. And this is just one way that we, we quantified that. This is the relative gut length. How long is their gut relative to their body based on how much inorganic sediment was there? They literally changed the shape of their body to accommodate this crappy food source, okay? Because they had to digest it, and they, they had to digest the algae, but the algae was full of sediment. Um, we're actually studying similar processes in the uh, Lake Erie tributaries, and this is um, Santa Pasica, <coughs> so you've probably seen around today. She did all sorts of, just an amazing amount of work on trips to Lake Erie. She, she's getting there in Lake Huron, but, um, I'm not allowed to show her face. She doesn't like her face. <laughs> anyway, the only, the only consistent thing that we got was that where there's higher chlorophyll, you have higher inorganic sediments. Again, suggesting that these sediments may be impinging upon the ability of grazers to control algae. There, we actually, we got a lot of other things. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about her, her stuff a little bit more. Um, She's working on farm ditches, which a lot of people, again, you look at this and it's not a, this isn't a real stream, why would I study this, etc. You know, I've taken stream ecology and the streams don't look like this. If we don't figure out how to regulate nutrients going into these streams and what it takes to get, to keep nutrients out of these streams and how nutrients are transported, we're never going to solve the problem of Lake Erie. So, so it's a really super important problem. And even just finding general patterns um, in these streams is really important and, and rather underdone. So these streams have plenty of light. They have plenty of nutrients. They have very flashy hydrology. Um, and it's, it's really important to try to figure out what determines what, how, when and how nutrients are transported. Um, so I think this is my last data slide. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about about her work other than to say a couple things. One is she's, she's trying to find something better than the nutrient diffusing substrata. So rather than putting these you know, complex arrays of nutrient diffusing substrata in the water, can we just go ask the algae? Are you N limited or P limited? Can you just go take a sample and figure that out? You could just measure the amount of nitrogen or phosphorus, nitrogen and phosphorus in the algae and say that's going to tell us. But you could also just use their metabolism. Are they, um, are they working hard to get N, or are they working hard to get um, phosphorus? 
And this is, this phos to lamp is a ratio of enzymes they're putting out for phosphorus versus enzymes they're putting out for organic nitrogen. And it's what we've seen so far, this, these are the nutrient concentrations. This is the Grand River. And you can see that essentially as you add SRP, the algae appear to be more and limited. Conversely, at higher nitrogen, you, you switch it to P limitation. The mommy and the portage did slightly different things, and those, that was interesting. I'm just not going to talk about it. But this is a very promising, sort of a, a very promising way to replace these things that, that are really pretty difficult to work with. Um, she's very difficult with them, I know. That they're really hard to work with. And so it's, it's a different way of getting to, the, to, to that answer. And at this point, it looks really promising. Um, with, we, we did some other things with, and this is actually data from last week. Um, Hannah and Liam have been out sampling streams, and I decided the pan you saw today, I decided I was going to try to use that to see if we could change the nutrient, to actually just test the clodophora, not, not all the other algae on the rock, but just the clodophora. So we used the pan to see what was happening with the clodophora. And all we did, we did a really um, very basic experiment where we did ambient nutrients, I'm not going to call it high, it's just what was in the stream, which is very high. Or we just did a normal, more normal low nutrient. We put them in there for, um, you know, five days or something. And then did measured photosynthesis with a pan before and after on these little microscope slides. It was actually very easy to collect a lot of data in a hurry that was pretty indicative. And what we saw was that actually when we took the nutrients away, the photosynthetic rate went down. And that sounds like, well, duh, except these things are in such high nutrients that, you know, I, I don't know that they're nutrient limited. These are, these are crazy high nutrient concentrations. And even our low nutrient concentrate, no, low nutrient bath wasn't all that low. So it's just like, well, that, that's it. Yeah, nutrients are still important, even with those crazy high nutrient concentrations. Um, the other thing that we noticed was this is light use efficiency, or how, how well the algae use light at low levels. And in the low nutrient, um, they got, they, this is kind of hard to explain, but this, did, this basically said they weren't as light limited when we took away the nutrients. And one of the things we noticed was that we were actually looking at these under slides and then running the PAM on them, is that after we put them in the low nutrient place for a while, the grazers actually removed all the epiphytes. The, uh, the clodophora have these tiny diatoms and stuff growing all over them, and the grazers had just gone through, and we washed the grazers because they're just <laughs> picking them off. So within uh, that five days, they, they actually reduced the epiphyte load pretty substantially and quickly. And that was just kind of cool, and that's just sort of hot off the presses. It was fun to do. But it's a way to explore how, how important these grazers are in, in determining um, the attached algal biomass in these systems. Okay, so first off, uh, attached algae are, are not evil. No, no algae are evil. <laughs> algae are important. They're important to food webs, and we need to understand what, what keeps lakes in balance. Um, benthic production is a resource for virtually all lake fish, whether directly or indirectly. It's very nutritious, but I also do a lot on food quality, um, fatty acid work. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't put in here. Um, they're really important for those highly nutritious algae are important for the fish and important for the people who eat the fish. There's work from like Tanganyika saying that these fish that are eating diatoms and getting heavy high omega-3s is really important in human brain development, which is fascinating, you know, just linking fish to basically human evolution. Um, they tolerate very heavy grazing and don't crash. So you can get really heavy grazing on, on benthic algae without crashing the whole system, but they do need a lot of light. When you make conditions that have a lot of light and have a lot of, of nutrients, you tend to get these horrible, this is like Erie, you know, that's like Tanganyika, that's like Erie. Okay, you get these massive clodophora blooms and you see things that, that you see the, uh, the algae are seen and not eaten. And I believe that this truncates the food web, that basically when you do this, you're, you're, you're really changing the resource base for fish and other animals. And that it's, it's a really important problem. So we may look at this as uh, it's unsightly, it causes people to close beaches. We need to look at it from an ecosystem perspective. We need to understand how do these healthy ecosystems work 
And what do we need to do? To, how do we need to manage land, people, and waste to make sure that they have their correct place in the food web? Um, this is, um, well, who knows who that is? Jane Goodall. <laughs> That's Jane Goodall, who studies chips. Um, anybody know who that is? That's Ryan Satchel. He's my technician. <laughs> He's a random student who came into my office and said, I, I like fish. I want to study fish. Can I work in your lab? And I said, sure. And a year later, we were going to Tanganyika. We went to Tanganyika. My husband, Elliot, walked into the Jane Goodall Institute and said, what do you do here? <laughs> Which I just love. And they said, we study chimps, and Jane Goodall is going to be here next week, and it's the 50th anniversary of her work. You want to be the, the research uh, jack to her party? And we're like, sure. And Jane was wonderful. Jane drank a lot of scotch. Um, really liked Ryan. I mean, she, she knows. It's like young people are the people who are going to save us. Those are the people I'm going to talk to. And so anyway, Ryan was just thrilled to be able to talk to Jane and spend an evening drinking scotch with her. And my point is it could be you. Yeah, you don't know who that guy is. But, you know, if you just seize what opportunities and you walk into people's labs and say, I want to study fish, you never know where it might take you. Um, I want to thank everybody. Basically, the different funding agencies that have funded this research, including Sea Grant, NSF, our university that's collapsing. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the Lake Tanganyika Ecosystem Project. Um, Pete McIntyre, I didn't mention him. He's just done a lot. A teacher, I, I brought a, I brought a um, sixth grade teacher to Lake Tanganyika who kind of thrilled his students by saying he got to meet Jane Goodall. Um, my, my PhD students here, Ronalda, Robin, who you didn't, you've seen some of her work there, but I didn't acknowledge her, Hannah, Sean, <laughs> Sean and his kids, and Leon, and various other students who have worked in the lab. Thank you. Yeah, you want to we introduce tilapia. 
Gross tilapia. They find them sometimes. They bump them in the right <laughs> Tilapia eat algae. Cuyahoga River, they caught some tilapia. Yeah. Well, that was and my they, idea for Grand Lake St. Mary's. Make it a tilapia yeah, farm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Take that phosphorus and ship it to people to eat. <laughs>